All right. Thanks for coming out on a snowy, cold evening in the middle of January. Um, we're gonna. This is going to be a treat for everybody, I promise you. So let me introduce Chad Sweeney here. He's written uh, six books of poetry and three books of translation, the latest of which is Pablo Neruda's The Call to Destroy Nixon. Um, Chad's poems have appeared in numerous journals, including uh, Best American Poems, and he's won uh, numerous awards, including a push cart. He teaches at Cal State San Bernardino. But this is biography, and you're here to experience some poetry. So let's talk about some poetry. Sweeney's work is imagistic, surreal, fresh, original, and often elicits a gasp of sudden self-recognition. Nouns become verbs, verbs sing and transform as grammar and syntax bends to the will of the moment as conscious dreams write themselves across the page. If this sounds like hyperbole, it is not. It's more of a warning. You're welcome. Voorhees uh, said that the Baroque period of any art occurs when it has expended its creative potential. What comes after is typically a return to basics, to fundamentals, to simplicity of form and clarity of content. The post-Baroque poet finds a way to strip out the extraneous and the florid in favor of the authentic, a true voice enacting itself on the page not as a representation of the poetic occasion, but the poetic occasion itself. Sometimes what the poem means is what the poem does. If the lyric poem of contemporary American, uh, America has reached the Baroque, if it has expended its creative potential in the repetition of what Lawrence Ferlinghetti calls workshop poems, Sweeney's work offers a visionary corrective. He is a poet of the unconscious, becoming manifest on the page, yet straining at the boundaries of its ability to comprehend itself. So like I said, this is a warning, but also an inv invitation to a world of imagination and urgency. Please welcome Chad Sweeney. Careful what you say. Listen, <laughs> how did that happen? Is that really what it's going to sound like? Very strange. Is that okay out there? Yeah. It is? That's okay for you? <laughs> it sounds, <clears throat> it, 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 I don't even know what to do about that. It just freaks me out. Okay. It's like uh, I'm wearing a helmet and I'm on the moon. <laughs> well, so nice to be here. I guess you could get used to this. <laughs> Do the dishes. <laughs> Take out the trash. I mean, if you could just turn that on at any moment, like around the house, I could get used to this. Okay, so nice to be here. Thank you to everyone who's here. And everyone who's not here, you should have come. <laughs> I'm going to read uh, a little from several books because uh, since I've come so very far from Southern California, I thought this is my chance to share just a few different styles with you. And then I'll focus on this new thing called Little Million Doors because uh, the great Jim Benton has taught this in his class and he wrote a, an incredible review of it. And so he's been a, quite an amazing scholar and friend in my life. And uh, so I'm really happy to be here and uh, I'm really happy to meet all of you. I hope after you'll stay and we can visit and get to know each other. I haven't met everyone yet. so. Let's at least meet once. Okay. Let me try something. Now, Jim was up there talking about, you know, making things new. Maybe we'll start with how I started. So let me read a little bit from my first book. And these are poems that begin to be narrative. They are poems of my life, experiences I had growing up in Oklahoma, with my Cherokee grandma and my preacher grandpa and uh, in the way of the storyteller uh, in the Great Plains. And then I moved to San Francisco. So halfway through this book, you start to notice I'm in San Francisco now and I'm developing into a whole new self and teaching and 
exploring and doing all sorts of things. So <coughs> this is a, this, these are poems that I guess uh, when you write your first book, it's very often a book of your, your life, a book of the things you do in your life, your childhood memories and so forth. So this is called the Osprey. This is a uh, sea eagle that I saw. And uh, one of the great things about the poets of Oregon is, is appreciation of nature and awareness of nature. And so I thought I would start with this. This is called the Osprey. Fog makes it easier to believe. The wet, gangly trees slope up from the water, blue-green and gray-green in half-written stanzas, disappearing by degrees. The sun, an idea only, where beech plums ripen in the sky first and then on the branch. Seagrass saying when, saying I and thou, and the osprey, no more holy than the water rat or cormorant or beached kelp glistening from last night's tempest. No less holy than the wood in this bench, than the stone in this man, the kingdom of the small, overwhelming the kingdom of the large. From this and into this, the osprey breaks with a fish in its talons. And here is the world an osprey bearing a fish, and the word fish, over power lines and marsh crabs, above swans and rotted docks, up to the platform on the utility pole, flapping three more times to the shapes of hunger in her nest. And that this poem, is the poem, now I was going to be an engineer, so all you young rapscallions out there who are planning your careers, I was going to be an engineer, and I thought that's the way to go. It's practical, I was good at math, but this Mohawk Iroquois poet named Maurice Kenny became my teacher and changed my whole life, changed the whole trajectory of my life. The first day of class, we were looking at a poem called Moccasin, and it looked to me on the page, it said, moccasin, 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 moccasin. I thought, okay, moccasin. So then he read the poem. And then as he was reading it, I realized it was his poem. And he read it, moccasin, 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 a hundred feet, a hundred feet. Dance, dance, move, move, moccasin. <gasps> and I felt this wave of energy surge through me at the power of language, that it wasn't something that lived on the page, but in the voice and in sound, in the human body. It lived in thousands of years of use. And that changed me right there. I changed majors and became a poet. Anyway, terrible idea, but that's what I did. So <laughs> this is called Bear for Maurice Kenny. He was, a, he was a bear. We had these terrible fights too, but that's the way poets are sometimes. Uh, this is called Bear for Maurice Kenny. Mohawk, Iroquois poet. Monday on the way to work, I must have taken a wrong turn. Bougainvillea climbed the doors, an unfamiliar alley in the silence of trees. The bear rose before me in a cloud of fur and roared in every language at once. Imagine my surprise. I threw the dictionary at the bear. I threw my calculator at him, the keys in my pockets, my credit cards. I threw the Bhagavad Gita at the bear, its pages dog-eared. I threw the Constitution, the original, at all Rilke's letters. I threw the Kabbalah at the bear. My God, I shouted. And the bear's shadow grew all around me. Oh, mystery. Thank you, Maurice. So with great force, he changed my life. And then this is a poem called Genealogy, and this is the first time I ever managed to write about my parents, which I did today in poetry class. I was asking students to write about their mothers and fathers. It's a very emotional thing to do. The first time I did it, I was quite uh, protective of myself and unable to write directly, but I wrote this poem that includes my mother and father, and I really cried. 
I was trying to do a genealogy that included family, ancestry, but also included consciousness, the genealogy of the moment of mind now. So it includes things I saw in San Francisco. It includes uh, the past of my parents' lives before they, before they had me. It includes the whole lineage of information, ideas, and images that helped make me. So this is a kind of a poet's genealogy. Along the streets, the candelabra, in amber points of sun reflected, car glass, arc of roof, antenna, it is in me. And the eye of a raven against fields of snow, the raven itself a kind of eye, the roving eye of winter by which the winter watches itself from shifting angles, caught in a flurry, now anchored briefly to pine, by memory or dream, I don't know how it arrived. It is in me. Mother, before she was my mother, little Cheryl hung by her knees from the red bud tree, allowing the white Sunday dress to flow over her head, allowing her hair scented with lie and faith to comb patterns in the dust, recording the day upside down, the smart white house of Mary's father who emerged in his Sabbath black to cast a look of such contempt and hurry his daughters into the car. No, Cheryl can't come to our church anymore. That the moment of the first shame would evoke itself in a thousand carpeted hours, it is in me. A cypress throws its windy shape against night, a portrait begun, the first clock lightning struck the water, a portrait over which the cypress agonized since before it was seed, a painting stars drafted, sea memorized, color of a gull's hunger, color of rainbow before the rain let go from its cloud, color root spoke to turtle eggs, is it jade, is it flint, did waves grind it in a mill? It is in me. Knuckle bloody against a plow. Grandpa Sweeney fell when no one was looking. The last hawk in the net of his eye recorded briefly in the ash. My father leapt down from that tractor to bury his own boyhood, 11 years old and Irish, fatherless, godless, barefooted boy stricken among the wheat which by its very shape reflected millennia of locusts and gestured that it too had measured the voices of creek and coyotes sleeping in fence rows, knuckle against the plow, a thorn bush planted that day in my father's eye. It is in me. And the first hand to blend pollen and clay against the cave wall, mother of Lilith, mother of Africa, mother of Harjo and Levertov, mother of Jasmine clutching at cliff ledge, mother of a drizzle, one particular day settled down over the rooftops of Dresden to reappear centuries later as a stand of aspen along a glacial brook. By memory or dream, it arrived. It is in me. So the lineage we we've come, whatever however we've come to be here, is so miraculous of cause and effect, going back in all directions, millions of years. It just blows the mind. All the rivers that had to flow, all the people that had to meet, all the people that had to survive wars and plagues and every terrible thing to make their way to who we are now. So thank you to the ancestors. Uh, so that's the first book, and I I was working in that sort of mode, I guess. Those, those poems seem true. I was working very hard to write the truth and to write about my life. And then I suddenly wrote this, this started this new style, which was what I called lyric ventriloquism. And these are more surreal. They are poems in the voice of other people. I started writing not from my own autobiography, but just from, from whatever I could imagine. It was very liberating to write. So, so this book which is, uh, might be my favorite of all. It's called um, Parable of Hide and Seek. And I'll read a couple of these. And I wrote, uh, <clears throat> I wrote 30 poems in one day when this, when this started. I started at midnight, and I wrote 24 hours all night, all day, and, all, and up till midnight the next night, 30 poems. So it started this new style. 
and I just was so happy with the new style that I didn't stop writing it. I didn't go to work that day. I didn't go to, I was in an MFA program. I didn't go to, to campus. I just stayed home and kept writing. And I would try to do other things. I would try to take a shower. I couldn't. I had to run out of the shower and write something. So I just kept hearing the voices and hearing the, the characters speaking to me. And so I'll, I'll read you a, a few of these. This is called The Piano Teacher. These are all in voices. This is in the voice of my piano teacher from when I was an adolescent, uh, Shui Ming Li, the piano teacher. A music box wound too tightly will explode, playing its song all at once. The practice is to unwind the song slowly. Think of this when you touch the key of C. A black hole warbles the note B flat in waves as wide as galaxies, 40 octaves below your house. Think of this when you love someone. Sound has its own horizon. Our meetings will happen there. The cello is floating away. The ribs of a tiger are rippling. And so when I was writing these, I didn't know what they meant. I didn't have time to know what they meant. They didn't close. They didn't finish their story, but they had this freshness that excited me. And so then I wrote, the, fir the first one I wrote at midnight was this, and I was laying in bed, and I heard this voice, and I jumped up to write it, and that's when the whole night of 30 poems began. This is called Even Rats Want to Swim. A weekday in August, pirates wait in ambush behind the Kmart. The compass needle swings again toward my mother beyond the mountains in a red cape, spooning milk to a cicada. The desert is more beautiful when framed by a door. Even rats want to swim back up to the sun. Listen, kid, there's no place better than a laundromat for meeting lonely women. A violinist lies prone, one ear to the tunnel, the city tunes its glass by that sound. So I had the image of a violinist listening to the Lincoln Tunnel the way he would to his own violin. And the Lincoln Tunnel vibrated in such a way that all the glass of New York City was tuned to that vibration. You know, so I was having these crazy ideas, but I was unstuck from writing about autobiography. I was able to write anyone's story. Whatever I saw, whatever I heard, it was very liberating. And so I realized I had all, this, all these pent-up stories in me. This is a poem um, called Sparks. And a lot of these are about a person kind of in crisis or, or what, what's happening to the individual in the crisis of our civilization, the crisis of America, the crisis of the new world, the crisis of the new technologies. This is a kid who grows up above a freeway in this little house. And this is, he starts dreaming about traffic. When he dreams, he, he hears traffic integrated into his dreams. So this is his voice. And again, when I was writing it, I didn't know all that. I just figured it out. I'm like, oh, this kid, well, look at this. Oh, wow, fascinating. So the, the voice happened, I wrote the poem, and then lay back down on the floor and waited for the next poem. This is called Sparks. Our house was built directly over the freeway. Dad used to throw his cigars at Volkswagens, little tobacco bombs. He'd laugh like an engine that wouldn't turn over. My sister burned happy faces into her arm with a lighter. Beauty marks, she said. At night, the house shook and tossed like a submarine in a war. I learned to incorporate traffic into my dreams. The princess dragged pipes through the stadium. When the teacher opened her mouth, a truck horn blared. I dreamed of a red switch behind the couch. No one knew what the switch did. When I flipped it off, the freeway stopped. On, off, on, off. Dad laughing like an ambulance. Isn't that sweet? That kid's real. He's real. Can you imagine dreaming a red switch behind the couch that turns off the freeway? And, and the dad used to throw cigars at Volkswagen. That's because he was in World War II. 
It, it makes perfect sense. I think this is, this is real. Anyway, this is called a love song. And uh, one of Professor Benton's favorite forms, lines that start with because. <laughs> a love song. Because a corpse bird lays its eggs in your mouth and the hatching is an act of speech. Because the shadow of a smokestack is clean. Because footprints don't float on the sea for long. Because a cat waiting beneath a bird bath will go hungry. And you in the open waiting for beauty will go hungry. Because a man drowning in a grain silo in the deep golden flax thinks only of the note in his back pocket that will not be given a love song. Oh, that's what I love about people. While this man is drowning in a grain silo, all he can think about is who he wanted to see later that day. When he got off work, he had a note in his back pocket that was going to express everything he had never been able to say. And that's the day he drowned. But he died thinking about her. Oh my God, it breaks my heart. And these people are fict fictional, fictational, you might say, but uh, they seem real to me. So I learned that you can have strong feelings for a fictional character, that you could feel through someone else, that you could have emotion through a character that you made up. And that was an important step uh, for me personally in poetry. So this is called Your Heritage. A trailer was dropped into a canyon. Wild horses draped the dust over prickly pear and yarrow. Only small things fell from the road, only the sun in its flight path. Jack rabbits were too quick for us, only the skeletons of deer see through on ridges. At night, the rocks glowed, mountains changed positions to confuse us. We had a door, but not a house. You were too young to remember. Your father thought of ways to survive. He squeezed water from the air. We were happy then. The sun climbs its elevator shaft. I promise. And someone keeps pulling sky past the screen door. Let's get married. Pasture of vermilion grass. Everything. Let's wrap each other inside the great quiet where beetles tend to crab apples. A yellow umbrella stays lit in the storm. Now this is an audience participation poem, okay? So <laughs> this character wakes up. I think, he's home. I think he's homeless. He wakes up and he hears everything talking to everything else, which is kind of extreme subjectivity. You could say he uh, has schizophrenia or that he really is able to... to to feel this, everything is in communication with everything else. Anyway, so he's having this wonderful moment. Uh, it, it's a very short poem. I've already talked longer than the whole poem, but the point is, when, when he says hello, I want ever, all of you to say hello back. Because you're going to be everything talking to everything else. And as you say hello, feel what that would feel like. You're everything talking to everything else. All the books, all the sky, all the plants all the bits of grass saying hello all at once to everything else. So if you can do all that, I mean, and I'll know if you're not thinking that way. I'll be able to hear it. I'm like an, I'm like an opera conductor. It's called Wednesday. A hubcap was ringing. So he just wakes up. A hubcap was ringing. I lay flat on the street to answer it. A fern was ringing. A tombstone. A ladle. It was a Wednesday at the center of the year, and everything was calling to everything else. Hello! 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 Hello. The clouds were doused in gasoline. Hello! Hello! I answered into a blue sheet fluttering on the line. Very good, very good. Thank you. <laughs> I, you were doing, I, I could tell you were really thinking, you were doing a good thing. You were really thinking deeply. So I'll just read a couple more of these. This is called uh, Into the Tunnel. 
Beyond the shipyard, the pounded metal of bay water, a helical structure of gulls, and one great arm sweeps the clouds over the edge. I've wanted to be that decisive, as during the first moments in a new room, I look to find the windows, then go and stand beside them. Factories stir fire into the sky. An airplane skids across, wraps defensively in its sound as a man is shouting into a tunnel. A man with a name tag on his suit and two drill holes in place of eyes is shouting, Hurry, son! The pipes have burst! He is right to be afraid. Water churns around the boy. It's excruciating to see this happen and to not embrace them both. What will you shout into the tunnel given this one opportunity when we all promise to listen? That surprised me. In the crisis of our moment, what is it that we have to say? What is it that we're willing to try and do? What are we doing? What will you shout into the tunnel? This is the last one I read from this book. It's got a little wet monster. So I wrote this. This is one of the most unconscious of all. I wrote this poem, and I saw this little wet monster in my fantasy, and I, and I was crying. It was my monster, and I was calling it to come home. Well, sitting right next to me on the couch was my very pregnant wife. And after I finished the poem, I, I knew right away that I was writing it for my unborn son, calling him into the world. Be born, be born, my little wet monster. But it's amazing because when I was writing it, I didn't even know what it was about. I just heard the words and saw the vision. So this is Little Wet Monster. The cornfield winds its halo darkly. Come home, my little wet monster. Time in the copper mine, time in the copper. Come darkling soon, come woe, my monster. Distance shines in the ice like a flower. Come early, little bornling. Before the fur lights gone from going, come rowing soon, come wet, my monster. Before the blood trees bramble over, come low, my rainweed monster. Come antler through the gates, my thingling. Your grapes contain the houses. Unmask the stones, my darkling grief. Come whole, my homeward early. You alone devour the night. Gather in your teeth, my zero. You devour the night's holy sound. Come home, my little wet monster. Come home. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> so it's obviously about a baby. Antler through the gates and your grapes contain the houses. It's, it's like the little testicles containing all possible futures. And then uh, gather in your teeth, my zero. As you see from nothing, it shapes its body and builds its teeth out of the air. It's mind-boggling how the unconscious works. It just dreams fully. So um, then I wanted to share with you a little bit of this one. This is called Wolf's Milk. I, 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 so I lived in South America, and I love Spanish so much. I love the Spanish language, and I love Spanish language poets. I read them all over and over and over. So finally, I decided to write a book in Spanish to see what would happen if I wrote a book in Spanish. So this is in Spanish and English, uh, it's and I'm the translator of myself. So the book is by Juan Sweeney, which is me, and then translated by Chad Sweeney. So it's, <laughs> it's in both languages. And in the introduction, it explains a little bit of who Juan Sweeney was. Uh, maybe I'll just read a little bit of the introduction. Little is known about the life of Juan Sweeney de las Minas de Cobre. He grew up between Andalusia, Ireland, Oklahoma, and Bolivia, lived centuries ago and has yet to be born. Vicente Huidobro wrote in a letter to Sweeney, Reading these poems, one desires annihilation and love in equal measures. One tastes metal as of an asteroid belt of old trains passing overhead. Juan Sweeney preferred riding on the backs of trains to being seated inside. He loved cheese and whiskey and has often been compared to the troubadour poet 
Cavalcanti for his lifestyle of travel and intrigues with women of court. He inspired the characterization of Cervantes' journeyman, Don Quixote, and paradoxically of Byron's archetypal hero. So apparently Cervantes based Don Quixote off the life of Juan Sweeney. And uh, anyway, so let me just read like two or three of these. I just want to get a sense of the Juan Sweeney. So writing this was really fun. And what I found is in writing in Spanish, the mind is completely different. Again, the personality changes through the language. The language is part of the mind in the sense that the language is part of the writing of the poetry. This really surprised me, the things that Juan Sweeney wrote. And as I came to write poems as him, I, I came to know him better and better. But I wrote these in about five weeks. And then it took a couple of years to make them better and, and translate them into English. The Spanish came first. And then I had to go and find some Andalusian Span Spaniards to check the Spanish side and make sure it wasn't just terrible. <laughs> so, and there were a couple of mistakes on that side. So this is um, number six. Drowned in pure air, the mirror of the air over roses, in a storm of clarity, the brown feet of a shepherdess to which no dust clings, the sun throwing its little lassos, the air in glass boxes stacked delicately, boxes of no edges and thus unbreakable as the penumbra bends through them the blood of all light. That's sangre de todo luz. It's one word in Spanish. Sangre de todo luz, blood of all light. I hurry from house to house for a needle to sew this hole in my pants. But the needle is only a metaphor, so I'll never find it. And the thread I'm looking for sutures the dusk to the night, sows the poplar leaves onto the branches of pine trees. As a city has citizens, a man may have citizens, but all my citizens have departed, leaving only this sign which I cannot even read. So he... Um, all the Spanish language surrealists grew up reading him. He's kind of the secret source of a lot of different things. And you'll notice that some of their styles throughout the book. So this is number nine. I also know these are just the lost nobles of Juan Sweeney. He had all these books published, and they were in the world's libraries, but they were systematically removed from the world's libraries. So what's left is just the scraps of notebooks. So I don't even know in what order these were written. I've just numbered them. I've just kind of taken a guess. This is number nine. The chrysanthemums are migrating south from Gibraltar in a slow rain of knives, crossing the steel summits of the waves. Do I love you? Yes, I love you. Now extinguish that lamp in the small night of your hair and kiss me. The wolves are migrating south from Gibraltar, granite wolves, sea wolves, their howls ripple outward underwater at the speed of law, at the speed of a king's head falling. Do I exaggerate? Yes, I exaggerate. Now hand me that whiskey and lay your head in my lap. One day the Juan who was and the not yet Juan will meet, not in paradise, but in spite of it. And it's fun. I just had no idea what he was going to say next the whole time. So this is um, a poem about his grandmothers. Apparently he had 17 grandmothers. He's a, he's, a, he's a person of the whole world. He's really like a hero of hybridity because he's, he's, he's not placed in any one language or in any one culture, which I think is what we're called on to do. I actually think this is an important moment where we need to expand ourselves as a nation, as a world, and be multiple. We need to be multi multilingual. We need to be tolerant and open and flexible and embrace all the world's cultures and not erase them or melt them down into one, but embrace them all and, and be among them and be, be them and be more than what we are. So I've learned from Juan Sweeney after reading this a few times. First, I hated the poems, and often I still do, but anyway, this is number 32. My Ethiopian grandmother keeps bees. My Slovenian grandma runs a brothel. My Irish grandmother is buried in clover at Kylemore Abbey with her five husbands. My Cherokee grandma smokes a pipe, nothing in it but music. My Spanish grandma watches parapets burn far into the future, but is blind to the ants biting her feet. They say it's too many grandmas. 
but I never understood math, so I visit them all anyway, in rotation. The Swedish grandma in summer, the Tibetan in spring. They let the chores pile up, so I'm nailing shingles and performing circumcisions all the time. Which is my favorite grandma? Whichever I'm with, of course. My Russian grandma, a duchess, white as ivory, chops wood in her sleep. My Arabian grandma tells the best stories. I am one of her stories. <laughs> then the next poem is about Shahrazad. So you realize that the, the Arabian grandmother is actually Shahrazad from A Thousand One Night's Tales. Bon Sweeney is all over the place. Um, let me jump to the very end and, and show you what he starts to do. He, he does kind of mature in some ways and becomes more philosophical. Early on, he's, he's kind of self-centered and egotistical, like someone I used to know. And he starts to mature as he gets older. So um, let me read one in his, his sort of more mature style, where he's becoming more philosophical and thoughtful. 53. As a child, I saw the wheel of fortune roll through the plaza and cut a man in half. I saw a tree burn for years, its leaves growing out as fast as the fire consumed them. The tree must have been a sign from God, but none of us understood it, so we had to chop it down. As a child, I watched a flock of geese cross the window pane, but the glass couldn't hold them. Its love was too thin. I saw a goldfinch drop the seeds of future mountains into water standing in the alleyway where I ran to hide from my brutal uncles. Have I dropped any seeds? I'm afraid the one to come won't recognize me. I'm afraid no one will recognize me. The sheep translates clover into wool. The stream translates rain into salamanders. Words can't hold a net for catching water. The sea is a mill grinding time into daughters. That's all of Juan Sweeney. And then, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get to is my new book. That's the only reason I'm really here is to read you this one. This was, none, of this was, none of this mattered. That wasn't even the point. But I don't know what time it is. Does anyone know? What is it? 8.12? Oh, there's plenty of time. Okay. Let me, so this, is, this has just come out, and I've never read from this in public. And then I'll focus, kind of, I'll read for about 10 minutes kind of on this final book. But this is a translation of Pablo Neruda, and it hasn't been translated for 40 years. Um, this was Pablo Neruda's final book, The Call to Destroy Nixon and to Advance the Chilean Revolution. And when he published this, Chile was in this terrible crisis where there was a lot of pressure from the United States to invade. Uh, to, to take over the copper mines, to take over the nitrate. And uh, Allende ran, or Neruda ran for president as the communist. He was a communist in the last few years. And he decided he couldn't win president that way, so he joined all of his forces in with, with Salvador Allende and became, and they won, the Socialist Party won the presidency. And one of the first things they started doing was changing the tax structure so that the poor people would have decent high schools and you know, decent schools and that sort of thing. But it was very dangerous to the United States to have a socialist country. So Nixon and the CIA invaded Chile and set up a new leader called Pinochet. And Pinochet killed and imprisoned 60,000 people. And so after this book was published, um, Neruda would be dead just a few months later. Salvador Allende would be killed and 60,000 people of his friends of, the, of this group were in jail or dead. And so it's really sad because the book calls on Chile to not have a civil war, to unite around its own history, its own national history, to love itself and to not fight. And so the book is ter terrifyingly sad. It's very political, very direct and political, not like his other work at all. That's one reason it's so little known and it hasn't been published in a long, long time. So I, when I was hitchhiking in South America, a truck driver gave me a copy of this in Spanish. And I read it then, and I promised, I'll translate this. I'm going to publish this in, in English in America. And it took all this time. So 
It took all this time for me to do it and to get permission to do it and find someone who would agree to publish it. So here it is, the call to destroy Nixon and to advance the Chilean revolution, actually written by Pablo Neruda and actually translated by me. I realize I have to make sure you know I'm being serious because you just never know, but this is for real. And um, let me read you the first one so you get a sense of the, sort, the way he talks about Nixon. When I was a young poet, this really surprised me. I, I, I didn't think this way about America. I didn't think other countries could see America this way. I was very shocked by it. And so here's the first one. I begin by invoking Walt Whitman. As one in love with my country, I summon you, necessary brother, old Walt Whitman of the gray hand, that with your extraordinary breath, verse by verse, we may cut Nixon to the root, the butcher president. Across the planet, no one is happy. Not one worker labors freely while his nose wheezes in Washington. Calling on the ancient bard who confers it, I take up my poetic duty, armed with revolutionary sonnets, to articulate without stuttering the sentence that until now has gone unexecuted against this famous criminal who despite his flights to the moon has murdered so many on our earth that my paper and pen quiver to write his name here, Nixon, Fuhrer of Genocide in the White House. <gasps> so when I read that as a 21-year-old, I was shocked. Uh, and I didn't know Neruda had this side. I thought of him as a love poet, as a, as a romantic, you know, I, I knew he, he loved Chile, he loved his country, he loved native people, he loved the workers. But this really surprised me. So um, I read this and it really affected me. I didn't understand anything about American colonialism or imperialism or hegemonies, or anything. I was just this innocent kid goofing around, hitchhiking. So here's a, I'm going to read um, two more of these, that's all. This is called, this is number 10, The Bard Returns. And Neruda was a, uh, he was living in France as a diplomat when he decided he had to come back to Chile and try to save it. So this is the poem he writes upon returning to Chile to say, look, I'm sorry I've been gone. I love you. I love Chile. Please trust me and let's try to fix this together. So he's coming back. I'm here again in your presence. Like one in love, I've come back from a painful separation to touch the sun and air and sea of Chile. Like a cup of gold and radiance, all this time my heart has remained full of Chile, of your serene folk ballad, my country of chickadees and snow, you were never for me a passing season, but a terrible wound in my gut, a moon bleeding over the pastures. I sunk my root in your mountains and flowered across your summits. I was never away in foreign lands with my poetry of three colors. I lived all year in your flag. This is why my nation, starred and white, my red and blue nation, nation first and primal, my delicate nation of Chile. From far away, I heard your drum and nervously approached your house and was overcome with grief. Oh, this book is heart-wrenching. Heart and then... Um, I'll read one more. This is number 30. I'm just giving you a taste of this before I get to the actual book I'm here to read. None of this matters. It's just warming you up. I'm like the warm-up band for myself. Anyway. But Neruda's better than me, so I, I, should, I shouldn't say anything like that. This is 30, The Sea the sea and the Love of Quevedo. So he's reading this Spanish poet named Quevedo who is jailed late in his life and exiled in a tower and then has a, has a terminal disease and dies there. So he's thinking about himself as a kind of Quevedo, a kind of protest poet who is in exile, dying. And Neruda's dying of cancer as he writes this book. That's the other thing I think I forgot to tell you. He's dying of cancer. Uh, he's writing this book. Chile is falling apart. There's danger everywhere. There are assassinations. The, the, the general who was trying to allow the president Allende to remain president was assassinated right, right out there on the floor of the parliament. And so um, 
times are tough. So this is the sea and the love of Covado. Here in my house in Isla Negra, which is Neruda's house, he lived on Isla Negra, on the coast of Chile. Here in my house in Isla Negra, I read the waves and my favorite verses in the pulse and spray of the bitter sea of crushing love, the same elemental spume of poetry, the sea that shines in its rupture. I feel it, Cavedo, this melancholy in both of us, so much love and misfortune, but perhaps my destiny is different. My military heart inclined me to join the guerrillas of the state, to pursue with the burning patience of truth and the proletariat a law to protect the poor. So uh, this was important to me. I really felt a bond with Neruda, and I really felt I was trying to do, his, do him right, do a service for him. And uh, I translated a book from Iranian, too, and I felt the same thing. I would almost cry in, in connection to the poet when I, when I felt like I was translating it and it was working. I could hear them laugh. So in the very end, when I worked and worked and worked and worked, I could finally hear Neruda approving of it. I finally saw him nod. And I was like, that's it. I think I did it. So it, it might not be perfect, but I sure tried hard. OK. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, for something entirely different. So then, um, now that you've heard sort of the way I think about poetry and the way I've written in different voices, this is called Little Million Doors. And this is, yet again, uh, a poem written, a book-length poem written in a trance, more or less, and hearing the voice of the poet. So when my father died uh, in 2010, he died um, just before his 65th birthday, suddenly of a heart attack, and I just went into a kind of shock, a grieving shock, uh, like PTSD syndrome, where I was having dislocation, uh, I was having amnesia, I was very angry, but I couldn't keep track of things. I was a PhD student, so I was supposed to work all the time, but my mind really just came unstuck. And so I wrote this book. After a few months of that kind of suffering, I suddenly started hearing this voice that seemed like, after writing several poems, seemed like the voice of a spirit who had just passed away. And I didn't know that. It starts with the line, my skin felt heavy. I left it draped over a chair which seems like it would tip me off. This is a, a ghost. He's dropping his body to walk out as a spirit. But I had written eight of these before I realized that it was the voice of a ghost. And um, every so often I would hear one in my head and I would have to write it down wherever I was. I would rush out. One time I ran out of a reading to, to write a bunch down and I just was overcome by it. There's no way I could be in public because my, I, I was seeing the images and hearing the voices. And so I wrote this until the voice stopped. And there's a kind of a journey the spirit takes of learning about the world. He seems to be blown like a wind in and out of the forms of other beings. He's looking out through their eyes. He lives as animals and as people. He sees their life just for a glimpse and then moves on. And he, he's not in control of that. That's the sensation of being in the book when you're reading it. It's hard to, in some ways it's hard to follow because it doesn't follow a linear narrative, but it's moments of this spirit being blown through the world and speaking and trying to articulate what it feels like. And so um, the other thing about this that's a little interesting is I have autism. I have high functioning autism. So most people don't realize that. They just <laughs> think there's something kind of weird about me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, and I, I've learned to, to function, I've learned to have friends and, and be among people, but I was a very lonely teenager. Uh, I really had to struggle to learn to connect to people and, and do small talk and stuff like that. I just didn't know how to do that sort of thing. So another way to look at this is that I'm having extreme autistic symptoms. So the lights are too bright and beautiful. The sounds are, are, are all dislocated. The mind is having trouble making sense of things, processing sensory information, which is what autism feels like. It's overwhelmingly beautiful and yet too much. Like, ah! And it goes back and forth between the sensation of terror and beauty and joy. And so it's possible 
that this book is about both things at once. It's about having an autistic breakdown and PTSD and the voice of a spirit who has just passed away. And, I, and some, sometimes I read it one way, sometimes I read it the other, and it makes sense both ways, which is amazing. And I think that's why the mind is the, most, the greatest mystery because we can, we can barely fathom what, what it does and what it's capable of. It's like the ice crystal trees of the mind in all directions blowing. So this is called Little Million Doors. Thank you for being here. It's really fun to be with you. And um, what I'll do with this is I'll read maybe for about 10 minutes. It's sort of one book length poem. So I'll just read some of it. And that way you'll get a sense of the progression. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of an arc and then the spirit seems to learn and then finally passes to whatever's next. And I don't, I don't know, I don't have any answers about what that means but it ends uh, on, a, on a feeling that feels something like an ending. Little Million Doors. My skin felt heavy. I left it draped over a chair to walk out across the wet colors of May. I could see time glow. I could see the ancestors of trees. Let me ask you this. What name was I? Each house in a street of houses, my hands in the trees for bells. I promise to what purpose was my story, the ripple of snake skins or sounds long in the curtains. Long days of rain, a phone was ringing high over the steps, the wet gables of the world, immortal it was, our souls streaming into quiets of wood grain. Toward what? plane of convergence for years I could not answer a music in pain the undying will undying in the dying grass and the road was all of bones and all and only I was on it and the road was all of bones and all and only I was on it walking to where at noon forever a voice far and thinly filling up the canyons the boxes of its meanings, I say was, what I mean is, will be. I tried to peel away the names. I said, who is God? And watched the sound ripple into green. I tried to pray. I said, take me to the center and spread thin. I was everywhere. If cities are nothing, a single bucket of night is enough. My clothes grew tired. An end of day, I begged this air to hundred me. As many genders as bees in the lavender field, my lovely hero, what nothing like sleep did the water. Where have you gone, little murder? Find me here. Did I grow a shadow in this? Did I belong to table and to roses? A woman leads the skeleton of a dog. Her mouth fro floats by, praying beneath her eyes where time gusts against the slow hills. And where am I in this? The hills are listening. So one strange effect is that it's one long sentence that never quite ends. So it, it, it more imitates bodilessness or uh, boundarylessness borderlessness and it works that way in the in the poem as well so in some ways it's hard to read but once you're in that mode of just reading right through it, it can be occupied it does something kind of strange to me and to other people when they read it their mind gets a little bit loose so don't do this while you're driving <laughs> sorry I mean because anyway see me I almost shout or I do shout I must be like green day stars a few washed out in the low heaven. I am the heaven that touches to shoelaces, to steps, the white lamps still lit at noon. I enter the museum to color square spaces of paint with my absence. Is this memory I am watching? Is this memory I am watching? A girl in red wool leads the sheep a long line of sheep over snow, and they follow her, small as she is. Is this my country? Inside the animals, an empty, larger than the falling in the falling of the snow. The grass is gold and white. 
the dead lawn of the courthouse, the moon shaking the statues are white. The moon, radiant, throwing its rings out, pins the shadows of dying animals, old coats cut from the sleep of mares. The elm trees gather the dark to spin it out against a grave in the moon's fire. I stood up from the pit, from the pits. The air was busy with us, all of us it was, faith only in gravity held an agreement. One swallow flew up from zero, a signal fire seen one mountain to the next, carried by deer, a living shadow on the wall. I hear the valley hurry over to relive weathers of other lives. I am born, I bear the cry, each animal its word in breaking seven nested futures. Who were we? Heaps of bones making love. I storm in shells of color past pouring out from if threads of inert fire trace the boundaries of the wheel. Are these the shapes I loved? I study the faces from inside them in trains looking out over fountains. From inside them the ivy over bridges is this happiness. From inside them the clover in the statues in the shaking of butterflies. A tattoo, my daughter's name in the garden. I remember my daughter in the high collective well of summer is necessary for something. To watch stars begin a gust of stars between the skull and skin and moving outward to find a rib. Is this my rib? Is it mine to lie beside a hundred years? This wide reflective face of water. Is there no shape for grief? The now what if petals blow the stems? I remember daisies, daisies in a word against the west wall of the house. I was murdered. I was stillborn. I died old, I try on these robes, in light reposed over patterns of water, surrounded then traced, all futures brimmed under grapevines, the wind a flower, I relived my death or someone's, here language opens at the wound. Here the house of effects, its procession of candles inside the body, one long day, the body, a lantern, how to say it, 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 lantern in a window is the body, hundreds of pains into sorrow moving beneath the river road. I've tried to hold to anger. A snow delineates the thin winter branches, but I am a tree of no branches, tree of no tree. If I let it, the snow throwing me down in pieces, tiny with it in drifts, all of me and blue. To lie up long, underside bridges, to feel the life pass over in wheels, in warmly, the stories, each heart's dark mouth saying yes and saying yes. To pretend to fall, to pretend to be afraid. Whimper, give me bone to shelter the weight of it even. A rope, the last yellow night, stirs the bluebells. This hill, I would carry my heart on a pillow. Yes. To lie down. I would carry my body all the way back. I would carry the eyes of it. I would carry the hands of it. I would wash the skin. I would bear the feet. I would draw the blood out long and shine it. And there are too many moons. Each of us through prisms echo the brightly against columns, the columns, a bodiless animal eating the air above tracks where no train is, little million doors and darkly. From here, the future looks like many attempts to ask. A single light, death it could be, asked innumerable shadows inside me. Whatever the opposite of lightning hangs unbearably above the barley field. Oh, can you imagine whatever the opposite of lightning hangs unbearably above the barley field? Some of these moments were unbearable to experience. And I was carrying my blood to a height above the city and dropping it, but nothing like a shout fell from me, a hole just then, into shining. And then 
there are points where it gets sad and dark. It, it gets to be a struggle for the spirit to understand what's happening. He's shown difficult things. He's shown murders. He's shown exploitation. He's shown slaveries. And he's shown prostitution. He's shown children being taken away. He's shown things all over the place. And he's just horrified by it and yet unable to do anything. And so there's this phase of difficulty and struggle before finally he starts to reach the end. And I'll jump toward the end uh, and just pick up near the end and, and then finish from the last few things. This is where he's accelerating toward his conclusion uh, as a being. I was quickling through archways over grain floors and water the arches were only my body, the wet steps of libraries, room after room, the fountains, a page of air I was, looking for an end in the book of everything, in shafts, the miners, in salt marshes, a turtle's wet roof, in reeds and mud, and watching thistle release its down, where hold and release were one word. In the small, I was watching the thistle I was futuring the thistle to twelve distances of God. What is this between us, a world? Or someone's hip bone wears the whole night, this tender sequence above the market, holding very and very still to keep to a glass chair in the river. I imagine a temple surrounded by itself is another word for wind. A man there is, follows me through woods every age, but this is no woods. A head on the road, the hands flutter, windows, whole rooms of his body, in doorways, his voice, in the crossing. Who, my son, in cedars? Is he me from the bell note? This thunder under granite understands us. To occupy the turnings of sky below the river, no difference between seeing and hearing return to the rim of zero, begging upward into stairs. The hands follow me into the sun. What am I that shakes? The mountain's high tree is generating distance, sending it out in waves against the air. What happened between us? I remember the future, a white branch of water split into gathering into its tree, one drop of blood at the mouth of the delta, this altar waiting for me, a weather, my footsteps howl in all directions, surrounding, then fleeing to carry. A boy was measuring the day. He had a big hoop. And this is where uh, I really see this as my father watching me writing the book. And I'm the boy, and the big hoop is the book trying to measure and understand the world. So after I wrote this, I just was stunned. And I see him looking at me uh, and wanting to communicate. A boy was measuring the day. He had a big hoop. The sun emptied its arrows into him. He thought the hoop invisible. And I wanted to tell him inside those arrows, oh, thankly and final, not much of me left. And this must be what love feels like. This is the last one. And this must be what love feels like. This spreading out over surfaces of leaves. They flicker out. The children, they are all children now. Their hands on the drums, the borders, and bread is and is. And bread is and is. This the gift? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to La Grand Library and to people of La Grand. If I'm elected president poet, I promise to free all the souls from hell. That's all. <laughs>